Welcome, everybody, to our Aspen Institute virtual discussion round on leadership in times of crisis, arts and culture. This is part um, of our leadership series um, on how leadership has changed in the crisis or should change um, in the crisis. Um, and last time we all met, um, we took a, a closer look at leadership in business. Um, and today we are moving into a different area and going to zoom in and excuse the pun into the area of arts and culture. When we announced this event um, on social media, I also asked, what is art to you? Um, and I got back um, two very nice um, expressions and I wanted to share this with you. Um, art is a form of communication. It helps me to dive into another world and sometimes also to process what has happened. And another person wrote, art is self-expression and a creative outlet. Um, I hope that today we will have the opportunity to dive into another world together and also to process together what happened over the last one and a half years and what is going to happen um, in the future. And I could not imagine um, a better panel of, um, of artists, curators um, and uh, supporters and sponsors um, to do so. And let me introduce um, our panelists of today, um, Christina Merz. Um, she is curator, exhibitions, Deutsche Bank um, collection. Um, and some of you might know her work um, because she's also responsible for the um, Art Populaire here in Berlin. And maybe you have been there um, before and took a look at the exhibitions. That's the woman behind it, um, so to say, but we will learn and hear more um, from Christina um, in a second. Um, let me also introduce Professor Mathilde Telt Heintje. She is a professor of visual arts, performance and media at the University of Arts um, here in Berlin. Um, and Mathilde joins us today from her, from her studio um, directly. And Cherise Bullock Bailey, she is um, Chief Strategy and Partnership Officer um, of, um, at Ghetto Film School. And she is also a board member of the Frick Collection um, in New York City. I just love that collection. And I certainly also love the Ghetto Film um, School. Thank you so much, the three of you, for joining us um, today. Um, before we dive into our discussion, um, I know that all of you are Zoom experts by now. Um, still, just a few words what we have to keep in mind. Um, please mute yourself um, if you are not speaking so that we don't have any background um, noises. Um, we will see all of you if you turn on your camera. Most of you have, which is fantastic. Some of you haven't. Um, when we do the discussion, just please turn on your video. It's really not so great for our speakers to look into a black void. So stay, stay on for us. Um, last um, but not least, um, right now you see all the faces and all, of all our speakers and participants. If you want to change this and just see the speakers, there's a way to do so. And you do that on the right-hand corner of your screen, it says Ansicht of, in German, and there you can change what you are seeing. Um, if this is a little bit too many faces for you, um, the view can be changed. And last but not least, we want to have also an, a discussion and do this interactively. So raise your electronic hand if you want to say something or use the chat function, and then I will call on you directly because we want to talk to each other. So let us start um, and let, um, so to say, the show begin. Um, and uh, Christina, um, I want to hand over to you before we also see something from the work you do. Christina, um, just tell us a little bit about what you do and the Palais Populaire. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting Deutsche Bank Art and Culture to take part in this timely discussion. Um, the question of leadership in this field, of course, um, 
is important and needs to be discussed. And so maybe I have to, to say a first little correction be that the Palais Populaire, of course, is a when you um, a cultural forum for the Deutsche Bank and um, where we show parts of our collection. So I'm responsible also for this exhibition with, with, um, with many other uh, colleagues and teams. And um, so um, we, so to maybe to give you an understanding that the Deutsche Bank collection is located in, in Frankfurt and the Palais Populaire is our um, venue in Berlin, where of course we have um, several exhibitions that we show during the year. And of course, it's a great um, possibility to also show works from the collection there. So um, um, therefore, I'm very, I'm looking very much forward to talk to you about this discussion about this yeah, very important, how you say topic, especially as Matilde Terheiner uh, is presented in the Deutsche Bank collection with her work. And um, we also have collaborated with Cherise Bailey Bullock um, from the Ghetto Film School on the Deutsche Bank Freeze Film Award in Los Angeles. So um, what does leadership mean for us as a corporate collection, so to say? Um, I would say first and foremost, our key principle is still providing access to contemporary art especially in these challenging times. And maybe to give you a little background about the Deutsche Bank collection that was found in 1979 in the line with the motto art at work. So the idea was first at that time that works of art should be shown in the, in the workplace and especially employees and um, yeah, and also clients have the possibility to meet with contemporary art, especially um, you can say if they maybe not have the possibility to go to museums or galleries. So this at that time, yeah, you can say it was a quite um, innovative idea um, in, to say that even 600 um, works of art um, uh, sorry, um, I have to I have to stop right now. But you can say that uh, more than six hundred branches right now, within four than more forty countries, are um, um, yeah equipped with art is is really important for us. And um, so um, it's it's a, it's a, um, it's a way how to how we can um, yeah show art in um, in the in, in the world. So um, to give you an impression of our work and how we do it, we prepared a little clip to um, show what we do. And so I maybe will, let's have a look. Let's have a look and I hope it works. <laughs> In our case, art builds a collection, which is the basis of our cultural engagement. To this day, we not only enjoy working surrounded by art, but also show works from the collection at our cultural forum, the Palais Populaire in Berlin, and at our partnering museums and platforms, like the Steel Museum in Frankfurt or the Fries Art Fair in London, New York and LA. We know that art helps ask better questions, and especially in times of crisis, such as the last two years, we realized what an important role art and artists can play in our social and cultural environment. And we continued to invite artists to enter into dialogue with us, our clients and our audience about the most urgent topics of our times including social diversity, feminism, social action, and the relationship between politics and the community. Our collection, as well as the various programs we have created, have always been built on a spirit of dialogue, cultural exchange, and change of perspective. And this is how we make art work, not just 
by building up a collection, but by offering a platform, activating it through exhibition and support programs such as Artists of the Year, and most importantly, providing access to a broad audience, inviting everybody to enter into dialogue. Um, so you, as you can see in the video clip, um, this is how the way we work and we present art today. So um, as for the leading ideas you're talking about, at that time in 1979, you could say it was quite innovative. So um, we can definitely say that providing access to contemporary art in the workspace has been a leading idea and um, should should be still an idea that we should follow today, even in the times of crisis. Thank you so much, um, Christina. Um, art questions, art transcends borders, um, and leadership is a very important um, topic to you um, and to what you do. Um, before I, we bring in um, Mathilde and uh, Chauvis, um, maybe you could also share with us what, what does leadership um, to you also personally mean and how do you bring it to the work you do? Um, first of all, of course, we have, a, we have responsibility and just to experience this in, in, a, in, in a workplace like that to, to really um, um, be able to tell stories through art and to, let, to select artworks and to provide access to, to, to the employees that maybe have not access to art is, is just an exciting way to work. And of course, um, in the field of leadership, um, it means that um, the idea to, to provide access needs to go on, especially in these times. As you can imagine, um, in the last two years, we, the, when we worked from home and um, the people could not go to the to the office and especially also the Palais Populaire has had to close the doors for several times. Um, for us, leadership means to still provide access and to create platforms. So it was for us really important to think about um, what does it mean for us as a corporate collection in these times to still, um, yes, to still, um, give the people the possibility to see art, to experience art, and also to um, provide access to the artists. So I think this is an is a really extremely important, um, how you say, yeah, idea. Um, yeah, just to show leadership and responsibility. Thank you so much. Um, let me bring in um, you, Mathilde. You have worked um, very closely with your art, with your students, with your artists throughout the crisis. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how you did that and what were the challenges and what leadership means to you. Yes, hello uh, everybody. Um, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear uh, Christina speak and um, I have to say uh, I work at the other end of the spectrum, so to say. I'm surrounded uh, by, with the producers of art. I'm also a producer of art myself. And uh, it's always very often a lonely and a pre precarious business, uh, maybe specifically uh, for women, uh, for instance. Um, so often there is no visibility to for producers and especially those who don't fit into the norm. Um, working with students means also working with um, all kinds of producers, people who are not even like established producers. So um, for me, um, leadership is um, in a way maybe not about uh, telling others what to do. Um, I think especially in the surrounding of mm. universities and education, it's, uh, but generally maybe it's, it's, I find it the best when I um, let other people find a place and a role for themselves, something that sort of seems suitable for them where they can fit uh, their capacities in the situation and I also think it's very much about listening actually so what I try to do is listen carefully 
and then bring people together on the base of what their needs are and what, uh, what future visions they have. So, so this is an important thing for me in my class to create that cohesion of a group and a feeling of uh, uh, mutual support. And I also would like to add, because you said something like what art could be for me, art is also an instrument to actually critically think about our reality and our surroundings. You know, it's, it's also in a way a tool to deconstruct and uh, think uh, things around you in a different way. So when we are talking about uh, in our Zoom conferences, of course, about, you know, what, what, what kind of performative uh, work we wanted to do and what the performance of the time was, uh, then we all very quickly came to the idea that the performance we do on Zoom is very much also bringing it back uh, to a sort of stereotypal way of behavior. And, uh, and even like, it's very much about, like you said before, and of course, everybody wants to look good. <laughs> so we were like, okay, let's deconstruct this and, and, and bring different parameters into to the game. And, and actually it was really nice. We had a lot of fun doing that, uh, trying not to play with uh, the, you know, not to go with the flow. So we could take a look at the video that um, I, I don't think it's the best quality because it's a recording of a screen recording and whatever, but uh, it gives you an idea how we were in a way trying to have fun together, despite all the kind of really also partly traumatic issues that came up uh, with our students. But of course I cannot show these. So here part of it where we had just fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you can also add experiment. You can grab your phone. Um, and you have this uh, light function, the, this torch. Because if you feel like, oh, my light conditions are not that great, so maybe you could take your phone and then increase your lighting. So you just can experiment, which is what makes you look best. This lo looks like a little bit of a sunset. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, and also if you still want to kind of disappear but not really turn on your camera, um, you can put the spotlight on your favorite part um, so you're not very not moving much. Um, and if you're really fed on everything, just can put it in front of the camera. I mean, or just it can become a part of your smile. I have a super shiny smile. A super shiny look. Finally, although constructionism is widely accepted and arguably at the heart of the sociological enterprise, there are still lingering challenges for constructionist sociologists that we aim to identify. Reality <laughs> stops us all. Thank you so much. Um, I really wish we would have done that in person and that we could be together. Um, but this already, I think, uh, gives you a really, really good um, uh, idea. And Matilda, those were all students of yours, right? Uh, yes, yes, my, my group is a bit, uh, is much bigger, uh, but this was rehearsal actually for kind of uh, interactive performance online. So it was uh, working with the polls and, uh, and the chat function where we're giving each other assignments. Um, yeah, you can see it's a bit slow. <laughs> I guess life slowed down during the pa pandemic. 
And uh, yeah, so, but actually like wearing this mask of everything is going well, uh, while at the same time, some people's uh, lives were falling apart, um, you know, was here in a way, uh, the, the, the formal question is like, how do you, yeah, set up, or how can you have different masks and how can you um, work with around that issue? Yeah, is there anything else um, you want me to talk about or is the time up already? Now, uh, I would have one follow-up question before I bring in um, Cherise. Um, and this is, you, you, you started by saying art or life as an artist can be lonely and can be precarious. Um, and probably, especially during the crisis. Um, how did you help your students get through this? Yeah, uh, in our university, we set up a fund, a fund a foundation or like, a, um, um, everybody was paying uh, the amount they could share, they could um, uh, uh, to, a, to a, oh, bank accounts and from there um, students could apply if they had difficulties. I guess it is more the problem that people are a bit ashamed, you know, um, to tell others it's not going well. I think the shame issue is bigger than actually then in the end um, getting the money. So. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if we, in the end, we really have a good overview of what actually happened and who's left behind and who is still there. Um, I'm happy that this upcoming semester will be live. So um, I'm going to see and find out. Um, maybe uh, it's, it's way more positive than I, than I assumed. So I hope so. Um, for me, uh, yeah, I, I, I felt it was a good way to, in a way, also uh, work with the digitally, uh, digital formats. And so it, uh, it's also something that sort of like enriched um, our, um, yeah, our curricula. So I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm about the, some of the effects of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. And I see, Cherise, that you're nodding. Um, yeah. And um, so tell us a little bit uh, about what you do, um, how you define leadership, and how you help your artists to get through the crisis. Thank you so much, Stormy. And um, I hope you can hear me. I'm sort of channeling from the beach here on the coast in, in, in uh, the New York area. Uh, and um, with that sort of ocean energy, I, I want to bring forward um, sort of a light moment of leadership and what we've experienced in the ghetto film school community and with filmmakers and storytellers at large. Um, I'm so I'm nodding because, uh, you know, Matilda, when you say leadership is listening, I think that is exactly where leadership begins and what we've learned to be true. Uh, throughout this um, unprecedented time. You know, for those of you who don't know Ghetto Film School, we've been around for 21 years, uh, born in the South Bronx. Uh, we have uh, film academies in both Los Angeles and London uh, to round out a three city model uh, where we support artists ages 14 through 34. And so we really develop and follow young people in a community in a very um, personalized way. And we are providing a rigorous and unmatched uh, art, arts education, if you will, um, at no cost. So that, that in itself is somewhat of a revolutionary act that comes out of this response of listening, which says, if you would like to make art, um, how would you like to make it? And most artists will tell you right now, get out of my way and I wouldn't, want to be encumbered um, with paying for it. So in, in some ways, you know, Ghetto Film School has been listening as a leader in the field from the very beginning. And our mission has been clear from the start, which is to educate, develop, and also celebrate uh, the next generation of artists. And we're now doing that globally. And I think the light moment I'll bring into the conversation is that in this pandemic moment, we've actually seen our artists thrive. And, um, and I think before I go into to why they've been thriving and why we've seen community be a resource, I'll just expand. I think not only is leadership listening, leadership is also close looking. Leadership is looking at 21 years in our case 
of a community of artists, a community of supporters and partners um, who believe in a sort of singular focused mission, which is to uplift all artists and that all artists deserve access, right? To, to the best quality resources. Um, but I think even further leadership is with that listening and close looking, taking measured and decisive action. And you know, I think GFS has been a leader in, uh, in our art and business and in a creative industry because uh, we haven't really sat by and waited for things to happen. We've always engendered uh, the creation process to happen with our own resources, with our own community members, really lifting up our artists um, within our own ecosystem, right? Somewhat of our own planetary environment of, of feeding into artists and also being um, deft enough uh, mature enough to get out of the way of artists because at the end of the day, um, I believe leadership is exhibited in creation and art making, which is why we listen to, why we look after, and why we develop our artists, particularly our young artists in our GFS community so dutifully and so carefully. Um, and so, you know, with that, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, what brought me here today is so exciting. Um, because we've had the great fortune of partnering with uh, Deutsche Bank and Freeze Art Fair. And one of the most salient examples of leadership in this time of pandemic uh, was our partnership with uh, creating the film, uh, a film award with Freeze Los Angeles and our partners. And what we have done uh, for now three years running is engage uh, an inclusive group of filmmakers, storytellers in Los Angeles to come together as a cohort to make film uh, and to be celebrated at the Freeze Art Fair. And one of those artists will be celebrated as sort of the, the winner of the Freeze Film Award. Um, one would, will be also feted as the audience award winner, but the truth is they're all winning artists in our eyes because they are part of a community. Right, And so leadership is community. Leadership is not doing it alone. Leadership is being humble enough to know that even the best artist herself is supported by a team. Uh, and so I think at the ethos and culture of leadership, particularly at Ghetto Film School, we have found over the years that reciprocity, uh, partnering reciprocally with artists, knowing when to get out of the way of artists, and of course, pouring into artists with not sort of the bare minimum, but like going over the top to make sure the results uh, for artists are held just as high as any result we, we would look to in our culture and society. Our artists are our historians, our documentarians. Um, they truly are our leaders. Uh, and, and when we look back at time, I would say even just looking back over the last 18 months, um, when we look back at the art that was made in a program like the Freeze Art uh, Fair and, and LA Film Award, what we see is the voice, the history, the record, both creatively, emotionally, and historically of this time. Yes, maybe, maybe I can. <laughs> Go, go, go ahead, but uh, Christina, we also want to see and hear the artist briefly. Yes, um, that's right. That was my setup for the, the <laughs> yes. video. I should be more explicit. I think we should get out of the way and hear from the artists themselves. Yes, I would I would say so too, but Christina, I don't forget you. And after we hear from the artists, um, I hand over to you. Thank you. <laughs> The prompt for this year's 2021 fellowship was to tell a story about how water and the environment uh, impact the culture and the people of Los Angeles. The sense of calm that you get when you're in front of water, I thought, okay, I really want to provide space for someone through my work to feel that serenity within themselves, to feel that stillness that we don't often get. And this project has really given me the confidence or rather like the urge to create more about LA and celebrating the community, uplifting my community to think like, hey, you know, I have a place there 
and the stories that we want to tell, you know, people are hungry for the stories. Finding your tribe and finding a sense of place, it can be challenging to find where you belong. It's time to see diverse stories and to be a diverse storyteller because the, the world looks diverse. What was so wonderful about this program was the ability to meet other filmmakers and other uh, people in the industry. It's been pretty great just to see the diversity in, in participants involved. I mean, like, we have an age range from like 19, 18 or 19, I believe, to about 32, 33. And they all come with different unique approaches on how to make film. And I think that's been super helpful. I got in and now I got to meet nine other individuals on Zoom who uh, have inspired me and I've learned a lot from. We're all coming from different backgrounds. Some of us are not even from LA. And just being able to get their insight and what their path was as a filmmaker through their questions and, and what they had to say about themselves was really what I was taking from it. And in turn, I will give myself and I will give other people stories that I want to see in the world. And I was like, what to me is the culture, essence, and truth of LA. And for me as an outsider, like, it's really about the places where I found home. And if I just like exist and tell the stories that I know and like my relationship with my family and our relationship to Los Angeles, more people are inclined to listen. And it probably makes the story more captivating to people because uh, I feel like the more specific you are, the more universal it is. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Thank you. And I'll just quickly say, just to, to synopsize, uh, the last 18 months have been ascendant, accretive for our storytellers, because in some ways, it's like the whole world has gotten out of their way, right? And they could really leverage technology, leverage the time and space to create without the barriers. And so without any discernment of getting to and fro, it have gotten to work virtually. And we have found ourselves sort of um, in this space of hybridity fidelity at GFS. We are the ones who are saying to our partners, to the world, this is how we should treat artists. This is how we should pour into them. And this moment, um, uh, fortunately in, in this case, has given us great examples of art making and community building uh, by listening and actually getting out of the way of artists. Thank you so much. Listening carefully, looking carefully, getting out of the way, but also creating a community. Uh, Christina, over to you. Um, I just wanted to add because it was just, um, so nice to hear, of course, that um, artists have the possibility to develop also in challenging times and that there are platforms that they can do so. And I think artists play, yeah, play just such an extremely important role here because through art, people experience alternative ways of thinking and they learn about different cultures, histories and relationship. And so, um, we, as a corporate collection, of course, um, this is the idea to provide all these platforms from our point of perspective as leadership, because um, in the best way, it makes people open to new ideas. And especially art does not only provide simple answers, it, it raises questions. And um, so you may say contemporary art even um, is a think tank for the future. And that's why it's so important to create this open platforms. And I think um, this is a positive, um, how you say, idea that we could take uh, from the last two years that um, of course, as many um, other cultural institutions, um, they made the experience that um, the technology and the way we had to communicate also had the positive um, impact on what we could do. And it was, um, I would say, a third room um, for to create, yeah, kind of platform to artists as well as to ideas. Thank you so much. As I said in the beginning, um, even if, if this is only Zoom, we still want to talk to each other. And I'm seeing um, many good friends from the Espen um, community who work intensely um, also on, 
on leadership responsibility and in crisis. I see Margaret, for example, um, but I also see um, Katrin Brinkhoff, um, and um, I also see some new faces um, who haven't been at our seminars before, like Marie Christine um, is with us, who's uh, Marie Christine Knob, who works um, also with um, young people and artists, um, and also Nelly um, Pullman, who did the uh, Deutschlandjahr um, in, in the United States and many others. So this is your opportunity uh, to get uh, to know our panelists and ask them questions um, and get into the discussion. And as I said, you just have to raise your um, electronic hand and then I'm going to call on you. And um, I just saw a hand going up. Let me see. Yes, it is Margaret. So Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks to the panel, first of all, and to you, Stormy, for organizing this. Um, I was immediately wondering, because some of us might come from, you know, corporate environments and, and, and businesses. Um, Charisse, a question to you. Do you think that what you are basically sort of asking uh, yourself to do is applicable for business, i.e. managers in corporations should actually you know, at least sometimes get out of the way of employees and just, you know, sort of give them the platform and then let the, um, let the magic happen. Uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Margaret. I, I, I do have some interesting backdrop. I started my career actually in, in the corporate world, in the finance world. And what I would say is that it's not specific to the sector. It's more about the culture of the organization. And even the largest, most corporate structures can have a, you know, no rules, um, trust-based approach to valuing the most important asset in a business, which is your people, right? We happen to be in the people business of supporting artists. You know, if you're at a bank, you're supporting bankers. And, you know, for us, it all, the culture begins with trust, right? If you trust your people, you are willing to get out of their way and help provide them with the resources to make decisions. Uh, and so I think there is a lot of um, crosswalking across all organizations at this moment in time. When I was uh, sort of moving through my career and managing teams, there was a phrase that was very popular called VUCA, right? And VUCA was like this sort of all, you know, Swiss army knife of like, this is kind of crazy. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And what you want is to have a team of people in any industry on any team who deal with this VUCA moment. If it's not the pandemic, it is a war. If it's not the war, it is fill in the blank. We are living in compounding levels of constant volatility and uncertainty. And so if you have the ability to listen, you have the ability to look very closely, but if you empower and trust your best people, our best people are artists, right? And in your institution, look to the right, look to the left, your best people are the people that you, that you serve and support, including your clients. Uh, get out of their way, trust them, right? Do the work, do the due diligence up front. It's about trust. At the corporate level, at the you know, government level, at the solopreneur level, right? Um, if we believe in the people and we treat them as their, our most valuable asset, right? in our society, we would move differently. Thank you so much. Um, let me also bring in um, Katrin Brinkhoff. Yeah, thank you so much Stormy for this invitation and thank you so much for the speakers for the touching insight, really very inspiring. Um, I'm a Berlin-based media psychologist and a facilitator, especially for interdisciplinary projects uh, in the field of digital transformation. For example, I don't know whether any of you um, um, knows about Link Masters. It's a project from the Volkswagen Stiftung and the Kulturstiftung Niedersachsen, and they bring artists, people from media, and um, AI programmers together to create projects which are then also financed in this project 
And um, thank you for, for your uh, inspiring definitions of, of leadership, you know, being visible, I think also having power. <laughs> and what you also said, being connected and what would interest uh, me, um, Cherise, and maybe also anybody, do you know of projects or do you feel that there are more um, projects, formats, whatever, that connect artists with other disciplines or that really actively bring in artists into the company world and also give them a mandate or power or, or a new role? Do you experience that? over there in the States yeah, or wherever. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you for that question. I think it's, it is a long conversation and I would probably start with the broadest form of uh, support to artists and institutions traditionally who are in the service of art and culture, which is philanthropy. And I think when we look at philanthropy for the last 100 years, let's say, we've seen big shifts and turns, right? And I think the best Uh, philanthropic organizations have had the foresight to not think in silos, but to always be thinking about how we're bridging um, leaders and thinkers and creators together, right? That there's sort of no them and us. It's just, how do we provide solutions? Uh, and so I think the best in sort of the philanthropy space do that. Um, I, I would say, I wouldn't call out um, just in the present moment that What we have done through our work with Deutsche Bank and the Freeze Art Fair is truly interdisciplinary. We're calling on visual artists uh, and filmmakers to consider contemporary art, consider their voices and, and think about a new platform, which for many of our artists, and I would say eight of 10 traditionally in each cohort has an MFA. So they are painters, they are sculptors, and they also make film, right? And so the artists themselves demand a multidisciplinary experience. I think from philanthropy, then you have intermediaries or programs, you know, like our, our leadership here at Ghetto Film School, who always are thinking in this hybrid way, right? The hybridity of art making and creativity um, is a response to that which exists um, in artists themselves. And I think, so there is always that alignment that exists. I think when we talk about funding and how we incentivize funding, that's when we often get bifurcated and say, hey, you can get a film grant versus saying, you're an amazing artist. I'm going to invest in you, right? And so that's, that's kind of what we've always done at GFS. And we tend to partner with whether it's a corporation or individual, or you know, traditional philanthropy who gets that part. We invest in people, not projects. Or you know, it, it really is about um, going back to trusting, believing, understanding that within a person, there's so much potential. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I do think you know, we're best in class in this panel. I'm so curious to hear about colleagues and what they have called out and seen emerge, particularly in the past two years. Thank you. Mathilde. Yeah, um, I think the question is quite interesting. Um, I don't actually think in terms of interdisciplinary, in the terms of like the merging of um, the different media as an art. I think this is happening uh, already for the last 100 years. So I think what is more interesting in the sense of uh, rethinking the placement of art um, and I don't know if this is what you were thinking about, but if you were talking about like um, the businesses working together with artists uh, in a kind of way of think tank and, and a different kind of creativity, I do feel that this is a very interesting thing to think about uh, in, in, in the sense of how can the platforms of art can be opened up. Because the, the, the platforms of art that I see uh, mostly are very much like narrowed down to the like the, the either you have the white cube or you have the the, the screening format, the, the performance formats. But the formats of um, where actually artists work together on new inventions with uh, with businesses or where they work maybe with social businesses together in participatory models of art. Um, I don't see that very much. Um, represented in the art platforms. I, I think it's also quite difficult maybe to present that kind of art, but um, 
Yeah, so I, would, I don't know if, if this is what you, you, you meant uh, with your question. I just wanted to follow up what Cherise was saying because I, fe I felt like there is more to it. You know, there's also, it's, it's not just about like uh, merging the, the di disciplines. It's very much also about opening up the idea what art could be and what role art could play in society generally. I don't know if uh, maybe um, this uh, I can I can play this back to the to Catherine. Catherine. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely uh, interesting point. I mean, you, you um, some of you were mentioning the VUCA world and and agility and and the leads that are suddenly there due to digital transformation. I mean, there's really a transformation going on, especially with this whole technological change where how you said and how others said, I think art could really play such a different role in society. And it's so necessary um, not only to think in products, because this yeah. is, I think, what many people feel, what I experienced being a facilitator, also working for companies, that often when you talk about VR or robotics or all these new um, tech and phenomena that are there in our world now, really rapidly transforming it, um, art uh, uh, is such a source. Uh, yes. To, I wanted to within just, this transformation. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. I want to just chime in because I think this is a fabulous conversation. Um, because you know, there's an old saying: it's not about the money, but it's about the money, right? And so, in this new world, is is it about the Bitcoin? Is it about what is the resource that is holding you between the gap between your vision? and your execution, right? Most of the time it's time or some resource, right? Some uh, actual resource, right? Um, in this past 18 months, we saw a lot of time open up and we saw a lot of great work open up. But what we did notice is that those who didn't have certain resources, these are just hard costs, equipment, paint, canvases, you know, um, electricity, you know, these are just hard costs and realities and resources to creation. Um, writing certainly, you know, has, has prevailed, but there, there's very low barrier uh, to resource there. So, uh, you know, I think again, like it's a fantastic opportunity to examine, right? Um, the possibilities are always endless, but we must really hold that fidelity to if you want people to work intentionally at a certain level to also um, consider a life, <laughs> right? Sort of all the things, you know, I, I'm very touched to hear Matilda talk about her students and, um, you know, just hearing that, you know, there's a real um, struggle for people to maintain um, on many levels at these difficult times. Um, but what I've found to, to be true in our community, and maybe it's because we are such a strong community that take cares, takes care of one another, thinks of one another in that same way that you're thinking of, of, of each other in your classrooms and your communities. Um, but the advantage of having these skill sets in this moment are um, just unprecedented. The ability to shift from making uh, visual media to producing virtually, to directing across time zones, to working asynchronous, asynchronously, right, is a clear advantage in terms of your um, ability to translate and transfer artistic, creative leadership. And, um, and I would just say um, even um, technical, gaps in this moment in time. So we, we just seen, um, again, back to the old Wall Street thing, it's not about the money, but it's about the money. When people are investing time, space, capacity to be capacious, we see results. Matilda just um, uh, said the role which artists and art plays in our society. Um, and I want to... Um, <laughs> ping pong the question back to you, Mathilde. Um, how did you discuss this uh, with your students, um, the role of art and society and their, their um, also role in society? 
<laughs> it's funny you say so because it's it's always the same thing people come from like this basic gear and they come into my class and they think you know they're going to be the genius artist uh, of the next 100 years and they have this like idea of singularity of that it's you know and, and then the first thing I, I ask yeah exactly this question what do you think art should what kind of role should art play what is your position where do you um, where do you come from? All of these questions that seem for them in the first place so not important because <laughs> they think they can just you know produce from their bellies or something. Yeah, so um, um, this is uh, this is the, the, it should be the center of art, to my opinion. This is should be the center of art making and art producing and art showing. Um, always uh, ping-ponging or, or questioning back where art could um, yeah, open up things. Um, but uh, yeah, the, of course, the, because it's so, so much structures in terms of, um, of media and of genres, uh, this is uh, where we also feel safe in and this is also the, the set of skills that you that you that you that you get uh, first maybe through schooling and, and then you specialize in your profession, but um, and that's what I what I liked about the idea of um, uh, yeah getting a little bit out of the out of maybe maybe the institutions should also get out of the way themselves sometimes you know going back to what Reese was saying um, yeah and um, I don't know if this answers your question actually. Yeah. But uh, no. yeah, this is uh, an ongoing issue in our class, but also an ongoing clash and a, and a shock. But in the end, uh, it's very, it's very, um, it 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 creates good discussions, and I think it works uh, in the end very well. And 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 students are prepared also for what comes after, because they don't um, are confronted with a reality that they never thought about. They already know that it's um, they have to make their own voice and they have to set their own position. And what I often see is that young artists are picked up by the art world and they have no voice anymore. They just, you know, they become an asset. They only start to produce um, yeah, products, um, like somebody already said. Uh, it's very hard for young artists not to lose their voice and because it's, uh, the, the structure is so, so big and there's so much involved. And meanwhile, also so much money involved in the art world. So. I think it's uh, this is good to keep uh, to keep in mind that this is uh, something to tackle. Thank you so much, um, and I want to bring in two um, more of our participants. Um, first, David uh, Inga, and then also Marie Christine. First, um, over to you, uh, David, and then over to Marie Christine. Hello, David Ehinger here. Um, I spent the last five years of my career as a Canadian diplomat as the head of the public affairs unit at the Canadian Embassy in Berlin. And of course, we were promoting Canadian art and linkages between Canadian artists and German artists um, during the time I was there. But I want to go back a little further um, to give you maybe a concrete example of um, of art and the rest of the world interacting. Um, early in my first career or my first time in, in Berlin, I was actually the economic counselor, but I brought over the uh, ex uh, head of the National Research Council of Canada, which is the major institution representing science and research in Canada. And I was fascinated to find that the gentleman I brought over, whose name I have forgotten this evening, um, had established the artist in residence program at the National Research Council. And I've just quickly Googled to find that that program still exists. And they have an artist in residence for research, in effect, in the National Research Council. And his description of why he thought this was important was that if you're trying to inspire creativity in any field, um, quite frankly, having an artist in the room helps to um, get those creative juices going. And that was basically a very important part of this example that I've, I've thought I might be interesting to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sh sharing. Um, that is uh, also something which I think um, Katrin, you were getting um, at um, a little earlier. So I hand over to Marie-Christine. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, super interesting discussion. I also worked as a cultural manager for like 10 years, and now I work as a consultant more in the business field. I work with companies now a lot, and I um, still find that arts and culture definitely, in my case, but in general, can, can absolutely be a source of inspiration, um, especially when it comes to identifying with your work, with your projects, like especially with these fashionable words, purpose and um, creating a bigger value and the enthusiasm and motivation I, I experienced while working as a cultural manager I think is still the strongest if I compare it to if people are driven by by money or if these are the incentives for for working and on the other hand I sometimes have to laugh when CEOs do the typical workshops where they for example act like a conductor with an orchestra and try to uh, yeah, copy these mechanisms into their leadership strategy. And I'd like to know from you, what do you, yeah, especially when it comes to leadership, what especially would you think you can learn from arts and culture, like in a very personal view of things? Thank you so much. And before we get back to our panelists for the last round, I also want to bring in Claire. My, my, my question is along the same lines, but maybe more explicit. Um, how can artists help uh, top managers to find back their, find their creativity, which they lose along the lines when they go up the ladder? Good point. I want to hear that answer too. Um, <laughs> and um, I think, uh, Katrin, is that a new hand or an old hand? It's actually a new hand, okay. very fitting to those other questions and a direct question to Christina Merz. How does the existence of the wonderful Art Populaire transform, influence leadership within the Deutsche Bank? Ah, that's also a very good question, which also, um, we, I think we do have to bring in Margaret on that um, as well. Um, so for the last round, because Margaret is responsible also for um, human resources and talent um, at Deutsche Bank. Um, so I would, I would suggest that we do a last round starting with Margaret, then Christina, Mathilde and Cherise. Right, I keep it short because I'm very conscious of time and want to hear from the panel. Uh, but indeed, I mean, we've experienced, as Christina was saying, uh, that, uh, you know, arts is influencing the way we're looking at it, opening up new perspectives and, and, and then obviously, you know, working back with the, our arts and culture team uh, to, um, you know, inspire them maybe for, you know, different connections uh, and, and, and connectivity. Uh, so I would say, um, you know, for, for many, uh, it is, you know, opening up our mindsets and, and, and perspectives and, and looking at the world in a different way. Um, Christina, I hand over to you to follow up on, on that. Yes, I mean, I think to come back to, to my first um, um, yeah, ideas to, to explain why um, Deutsche Bank started to um, install artworks in all the offices all around the world. I mean, it was the idea that especially contemporary art has the capacity to open up and to, um, especially an in international collection, if you, if, if you think about 600 branches where in 40 countries where international artworks are presented and we have um, guided tours, we have talks with the artists and especially um, you said the Palais Populaire is, is our platform where we not only present the Deutsche Bank collection, um, but we also invite artists, for example, for the, uh, our series Artist of the Year, where um, young artists are invited to produce an exhibition and catalog. And this is a platform where not only curators and artists meet. I mean, we invite our employees, we invite our clients, and they have the possibility to see what they do. And not only German artists, it's more about diversity, about different ideas. And this, is a, this is a, has been the idea from the very beginning that art can create creativity. I mean, if you just imagine that all of our employees that work in, in the Deutsche Bank have art around them. And it's not on, maybe only 
always inspiring maybe it's also you know it's maybe sometimes you you raise questions you you want to know more about it maybe you don't even like the work so much but after all if you talk about it and if you have the dialogue between employees clients and artists they can create they can create really new ideas and i think this affects the workspace and this was the idea um 40 years yeah now 40 years ago So I don't know if this answers the question regarding the Palais Populaire, but um, I think um, this platform is also, it's not only for, for, for the artists, but also for, for clients and um, a diverse audience, you can say. So where different people can meet. And it's not only that art lovers can meet or you know that artists meet and uh, an art crowd. It's more about um, to really create a platform where different audiences can meet and we can we can open it up and i think that's important especially in these times interesting thank, thank you, you so much uh, christina and um over to you matilde uh, the, the question of leadership and culture um uh, whether art can influence leadership I, I i don't know actually i don't know about this uh, really to be honest um well, I do like what was said before that um, uh, the idea to include artists in teams, uh, business teams or in company teams um, as, uh, yeah, to, to bring in different uh, contexts. I think it would solve maybe also the precarious situation of many artists. There are way more artists trained than uh, the market can ever hold. Um, so I do think, um, yeah, this would be a good solution, you know, and if I, if I listen <laughs> to the problems around me, then I would say, yes, I see a lot of like uh, organizations getting stuck in bureaucracy and, and rules and regulations. And, uh, and I see on the other hand, I see a lot of uh, free potential um, not being seen, not, not with no use. And then I, I can see so easily why this could work together and create a new way of, uh, of a new art form in a way. Um, yeah, so this is how I imagine. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very good recommendation. And um, I, maybe some of our um, participants are going to follow up um, on it from the business yeah. community. And last but not least, Louise. Thank you so much. And I think this is, this is a brilliant question for strategists. I'm a strategist um, by training and at uh, GFS. We uh, took the strategic approach to create a consultancy. And so in the last three years, we formalized a strategic consulting and advisory practice. And in fact, the work that we do with the Freeze Art Fair and Deutsche Bank is, is one of our projects where we bridge the gap between businesses and the next generation of artists, inclusive artists. So we're providing a range of services, I would say primarily intellectual property, creative services, and talent development solutions. And the most sort of elegant solution that's reciprocal for us is that we get to hire all of our alums and our artists in our community um, to uh, run these projects and to service these projects. So you literally have a team of artists who've been trained um, some, sometimes from the earliest of age uh, 14. Um, and and we um, were able to kind of really support and walk with our partners through dream points and pain points. Uh, but it's been um, it's been an extraordinary solution to actually provide a for profit and you know basically an, an economic engine through our consulting business. So we're we're very proud of that reciprocal solution, and I'm um, welcome any further um, communication and thought leadership, thought partnership from everyone who's been here. Um, we we've been you know very lucky to have a very ascendant business during this. Um, short period of VUCA that we've all had. Thank you so much um, to Christina, to Mathilde, to Chouise, um, also to Margaret um, who helped us set up um, this event. This was just an appetizer, um, I would say, for our dive into the art and cultural work. Um, and I hope that we will continue. We will certainly also continue our series of um, leadership um, in times of uncertainty and, and crises. So please join us when we take a look um, into other fields as well. I thought 
uh, I mean, at least for me, I took away a lot, a lot of ideas, um, a lot of a lot of thinking. Um, and I want to come back for with a quote we, I started with: "Artists to form a form of communication." Um, so let's keep communicating with each other, and hopefully next time also um, in person. Thank you so much for taking the time. I wish you a wonderful night, and I hope to see many of you again in our next Aspen um, events. Um, and go to those art exhibitions and support the artists. They really need it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.